Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, who loves us, holy, merciful Father, we who had departed far from you, living in our sin, you found us. And for the great judgment that was, and the condemnation that was supposed to be upon us, our Lord Jesus Christ took it in our stead, and through his precious blood spilt, you cleansed our souls and spirits eternally. And without any righteousness of our own, you saved us. And for this grace, we thank you. Lord, there is no hope, uh, happiness, or purpose in this world, but you have given us true liberty and peace and eternal hope. And for these things, we give you thanks. Lord, our bodies, our spirits, all of us you have bought with your blood, Use us according to your will. Please help us to uh, to live for your gospel, for your will. Whether we live or whether we die, everything for you, only for your glory. Please help us to live uh, and protect us, rule over us and lead us. And for all your graces, we thank you. Lord, at this time we have gathered together uh, to learn of your words. For you who led us before your words, we thank you. Lord, uh, because of the coronavirus, um, it's been difficult for us to gather together to listen to your words, to have fellowship, and to preach the gospel. And yet, in the midst of all this, you keep our faith. You give us a larger heart to rely on you, to trust in you. And we thank you for protecting and keeping our faiths. Lord, at this time, for the many people who are listening online, Lord, please keep all of their hearts and reveal to us your word that together we might understand that the remainder of the lives that we have, uh, that you have allowed us to live, that we might not live that in vain, but only for your holy will, living for your glory. And for the great work that you have entrusted us, please help us to live in obedience and guide us. Lord, through the coronavirus, please uh, be with the churches that are undergoing through undergoing through hardship because of that virus. And for those who are sick, please give a speedy recovery. And please uh, let this plague to pass quickly. That we might once again freely have fellowship. And for the many lost souls who have not yet understood the gospel, that we might take this gospel to them that according to your will, many people might be saved, that your work of salvation might be done abundantly. Please give us one more opportunity, one last opportunity for for this purpose. We entrust everything into your powerful hands. We ask that none of us might fall away from the faith. And even at this time, you desire to give us your words that we need to hear, to reveal to us your holy will, that you might show us how we ought to walk and live. Please teach us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have the praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, many people of the world are suffering because of that virus. Many people are die have died according to because of the virus, and many people are having hardships. And um, there's even uh, you know uh, big effects on the world economy. And Jesus also spoke of these things that would happen. And when we see all these things, know that it is near. That's what Jesus said. And of, of those signs, of course, it's we know that there's earthquakes, famines, and pestilences. And those, um, those signs and, and those plagues are, are in effect um, because of Adam's sin in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Of course, that the Garden of Eden is an image of the new heaven and the new earth that is to come. Uh, it is the image of heaven to come. But at, at the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam was kicked out of the Garden before God. And he lost his right to the eternal hope, eternal place in heaven. And wherever sinful man goes, there is no liberty and there is no peace. That's what God wanted to show uh, all mankind. And that's why he cursed the ground. And through suffering, hardships, death, uh, that has been assigned to man. We know in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 33, it says that God does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men.
but God does not give plagues so that people would die because he hates us for our sin, but he desires that all men would realize their sin and repent, turn to God in order to have true peace and true rest and true happiness in God. Now, the thing that God desires to give us is not this world, but the eternal heaven with eternal life, with eternal peace and glory that comes with. But mankind that had sinned can never find peace, happiness, joy in this world. And God gives these plagues and hardships and suffering so that man, man's heart might not be bound to the temporary things of this world. And as the end draws nearer, those uh, the, the sufferings of the world will escalate. And, uh, you know, we know in the past that the Lord judged the world with water and he is now going to judge the world in the coming world or soon will judge the world with fire. And we have uh, mankind has the nuclear arsonry to destroy the world 100 times over. And we know that World War Three will occur at a certain point. And yet people are still thinking that there's going to be you know, some kind of good fortune that's going to happen in the future that will prevent that from happening. But that is a vain hope. We as Christians, not only have we received salvation, but through the word of God, we have come to understand God's will, God's plan. And we come to know it more and more. And we know the great a heaven that God has prepared for us. And we as people of God uh, must make the correct preparations uh, to enter into heaven. We are living in these end times that God has pre-appointed. And that is, uh, we can know that for sure. If we see all these things happening, we should, uh, we cannot doubt that we're living in the end times. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And before this uh, before this passes away, everything will happen. Right? All the signs will occur. There are many signs that will occur in the end times according to Christ. And when, when you see the beginning of these things to happen, we, sh- we know that that generation will not pass. And we are can be we can know that we are living in that generation, and yet many people today live by their own wisdom, their own experience, trying to make this world a, a heaven on earth, and they're striving to make this earth a better place. However. No uh, no effort of man or, or wisdom of man or, or scientific advancement of man can stop the plague of God, the plagues of God, the sufferings that God gives. We cannot even stop this small invisible virus that is wrecking the world. Gives suffering to many people, causes death in many people, and many people are trying to live well in this world. But everything that man has stored up for himself will, in a moment, in a day, uh, pass away. Right? We're living in th- those kind of times. So, with all these vain thoughts of man, all the vain plans and the pride of man, God can cut down in a moment. The fact that we are saved in these end times is an amazing grace. And when we see the signs that are coming upon this world, we know that our Lord's coming is near. We need, therefore, to become more prepared in our hearts so that we might not be found in shame when he comes, that we might be found uh, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing Uh, But we would strive to appear before him as sanctified and perfect. You know, when we were saved, we were saved as wretched sinners. But when the Lord returns, 
We want to be those who are unashamed in entering into the kingdom of heaven. We need to make those preparations. We need to reflect on ourselves. We have to figure out what is our lackings, what is our wrongdoings, and what are things that when I stand before Christ that I will be ashamed of? Am I, am I ready to stand before him? We need deep thought and meditation upon that. But we desire, what we greatly desire, as it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And that's the end of the scriptures, right? The Lord himself desires to come quickly. We who are living in these end times as born-again Christians, you know, Christ wants to save us from our sufferings and our hardships. He wants to take us to heaven. We know in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, it says, I am, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. So after we're saved and every life of uh, everything that we do in obedience to him, the Lord will re re uh, reward us with a reward. And so that's why the Lord desires to come quickly to reward us. And we also desire that he would come quickly. So even if it's today, it would be great if the Lord came. You know, in the hardships that we have, we realize that there really is no hope to be had in this world. And we have a great desire to long for him. And this is, you know, the same heart for all Christians. So in our hearts, we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. And yet, and yet, there are so many lost souls, these impoverished souls that are not yet saved. What should we do about them? If it is the Lord's will, then we desire him to give us one more opportunity to, burn, uh, to evangelize and to preach this gospel. And I think according to that desire, I don't think the Lord will end time soon. I think he will give us one more opportunity and everything is being made ready. One more chance for us to put forth our best effort in evangelizing and preaching the gospel. And according to our earnest hope, we would be able to put all forth our effort into uh, to, to the ministry, international ministry uh, of preaching the gospel throughout the whole world. There are many people across the world who have not heard the gospel. And for their sake, we must do with all of our heart, all of our strength, that not one of us would shy away from that work, but that we would all particip participate together. We all desire to stand before the Lord in in that way. And, you know, because of this coronavirus, we weren't able to preach the gospel freely. But as you know, we had um, our retreat through the online format. And I think God has allowed this kind of technology to advance for this purpose. You know, the advancement of, of technology is not for, you know, entertainment, but I think God is allowing it for the preaching of the gospel. You know, we have the um, the advancement of, of informa uh, transfer of information, of, of technologies, and because of all these things, we were able to have our, our retreat online. And though it was difficult, uh, but through our prayers and through uh, diligent evangelism, Many people listen to the, the words of God, and I believe that many people receive salvation. And now today, I wanted to speak upon um, some messages that would be helpful for those who are newly born again, some important um, things that we need to um, be taught. So the title for today's sermon is, The Church and the Christian. The church and the Christian, and I want to speak on this topic. So, if you take a look at our passage, this is in Psalms 107, verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. 
This was spoken about a thousand years before Jesus uh, came into this world, about 3,000 years ago. In the Old Testament times, there were, in a time when no one was seeking God, uh, God chose a man named Abraham, and he chose the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, uh, to be their to be their God and to rule over them. But yet, the salvation of the Lord was not clearly revealed. And they did not understand what was the salvation uh, of the soul that was to be done by the work of Jesus Christ. There are many images and shadows of that in the Old Testament, but Christ himself didn't come. But there were many uh, images and shadows of the things to come. So, here, in verse 2, it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord. Those who were to be saved by the work of Jesus Christ through faith in him, that is what it means to be redeemed. Redeemed means when, let's say that there were, uh, you know, back in the old times, there were many slaves that were sold. And let's say someone uh, saw a slave who was, you know, in an iron uh, fetters and he was being dragged along. At that time, someone pays the, the price of the slave. We call that the redemption money, right? That's why in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, it talks about how Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. In other words, a redemption a cost, right? Um, ransom. So to pay that cost, in the Old Testament times, uh, they used you know, goats and lambs. But as we know in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it's not possible that the blood, the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. But through Jesus Christ... Um, we know that he who was the real thing was being uh, foreshadowed by those things, by the goats and the lambs and the bulls. It was showing that the Son of God, Christ, Jesus Christ, would come and through his precious blood he would redeem us. And redemption is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And here in Psalm 107, it is being foretold, right? Um, the redeemed of the Lord, right? That's talking about us. We are the redeemed of the Lord. That the redeemed of the Lord that's speak, spoken of in this Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we have that work, that grace, that work of grace fulfilled in us. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those who are saved have something to say. We as Christians do have something to say. What is it? You know, when a little child has a special gift that he has that no other, you know, kid has, he'll say, oh, you know, my, my dad bought this um, toy from America and you don't have it. So he's boasting of it. You know, my father gave this to me and all the other children will be envious of him. We as Christians have something to say. Those who are saved cannot live with closed mouths. We speak of what we have seen, right? We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. But the things, uh, when it says to let the redeemed say so, it says, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Who is the enemy? The enemy is Satan. The enemy of God, the en our enemy, who had bound us with the fetters of sin and was trying to drag us to hell, the Lord has redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Verse 3, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Jesus took the scattered people of God and made them one through the death, through his death on the cross. And when the whole world, uh, you know, when the gospel was preached to the whole world, what, where, you know, to the west, east, north, and south, right? In Psalms 50 verse 1, it says, The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. <clears throat> you know, come forth, and if you come before me, then you'll be saved. So the gospel has been preached throughout the world. 
And from each of those directions, God has gathered them out of their lands. God has gathered his redeemed. The fact that, the fact that we are gathered here You know, because of the coronavirus, many people, uh, we're, you know, many ch- churches are not having uh, physical meetings, but are doing it online. And even now we're speaking it that way. Um, but yet I feel that our hearts are being gathered, right? Whether it's in your families or wherever, right? Throughout the whole nation. We have 219 churches in Korea. And in the 76 countries, uh, we have churches in 76 countries, um, 770 churches in those 76 countries internationally. And we as Christians are gathering together. Because God is the one who has gathered us. Because we are saved, therefore we gather. We have the same faith. We have the same hope. We have the same purpose of living. We have been guided by one spirit. That's why we gather together. If we have time, we gather together. We gather our hearts. We gather our thoughts. We gather our strengths. So that we might fulfill God's holy will. God is the one who has gathered us. In the Greek, the word for church is the word is the word ecclesia. And ecclesia means those that have been gathered by God. It is the the group that has been separated because they have been because they have worn upon the love of Christ, because they have been separated to enter the kingdom of heaven, because they have been separated to the work of God. That group, that is the church. You know, after we're saved, we are no longer individuals, but we are now a part of the church. God is the one who has gathered us. This word has been spoken a thousand years before Christ came, but it was speaking of people who would come after Christ, who would be gathered by his work. In Psalms 16 verse 3, As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The saints who are on the earth are those who have been born again, who have been saved with same uh, faith, same hope. Those saints, they are that holy gathering, the church. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. The church is not a building. Many people think when they say church, they think some kind of, uh, you know, a, a building with a steeple with a cross on top. And when people see big churches, they say, oh, that's a that's a big church. That's a well-built church. But we should be more careful with our language because that itself is not a church. You know, if you say church building... Um, that is more acceptable and that is that is more correct you know some people when they you know when, you know when you pass by someone's house there's not a lot of um, individual houses in korea and a lot of people are living in apartments but um you know when you receive when you have a mailbox you would put your name on the mailbox it doesn't mean that the mailbox or the house is called by that name but it means that the person who has that name lives in that house you know we have for example the seoul central church this is the building where the the saints of soul of soul gather. That's what this that's what that means. In the early church, there were no separate buildings uh, to gather in. Only um, in eighty three hundred, when you know the Catholic Church started building uh, temp- uh, monasteries, was when they had separate. Buildings, but you know, in the old, uh, in the New Testament, talks about the churches that are in the houses of Aquila, the houses of Priscilla. Um, that that gathering is the church. You know, the the church that was gathered in uh, Aquippo's house. Uh, you know, however it is expressed, right? The in the Corinthian church, 
didn't have a separate building, but it was but the Bible was speaking about the gathering, the people, the saints. Whether that's inside of a cave, inside of a house, whether it's in the beach, you know, because they didn't have a building, they were chased around, persecuted. But wherever the people were, that was the church. The born again saints. To those who are not saved cannot become part of the church. But you know, today, there are many people who are not saved who gather at, for a social gathering and call that a church. But in our eyes, in biblical viewpoints, that is not a church, but that is uh, just a gathering in name. They might boast in their whatever they do, but that is not where the work of God is done. We know that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the house of God, and we as living stones are being built together to become the household of God. And we can't have dead stones a part of the living stones, right? Even flowers, for example, you know, these flowers in front are real. But nowadays, there are fake flowers. And they make, nowadays, they make fake flowers really beautifully. It's almost identical. And you can't really tell by looking at them from far away. They even put like fake water droplets as if someone had just watered those plants, watered those flowers. And some plants, some fake plants have a, give off an aroma like a flowery scent. And if you're not paying attention, you might think that that's real. I know one of our Japanese sisters brought home a fake flower and her hus- her husband would give water to this fake flower every day because he was, he was tricked. He thought it was a real flower. But no matter how beautiful a fake flower is, it's fake. It has no life. It will not grow. It won't wilt away. You don't have to give it water. On the outside... It looks beautiful. And, you know, churches on the outside might praise God. They might pray. They might have service. But if they're not saved, then before God, that's not a real church. Now, whether people gather in a poor house or in the beach on the out, you know, in the beach. Or one of our sisters. Uh, there are pl- some churches where, you know, a sister would go and preach to her students and they would gather at the beach or, or somewhere. And that w- that's a church, right? So where there are two or three that, that are speaking in Christ's name, who have gathered in Christ's name, that is the church. And the church of God is what God has gathered from the world. You know, if I was not saved and I think about what my life would be like... Uh, I'm very afraid of what could have happened. Because I'm saved, I'm here. You know, God planned to judge the world with water. And God told Noah to build an ark. And Noah obeyed. And as soon as the ark was built, God told Noah to enter into the ark with his family members and with, um, you know, all the animals that creeped on the earth, um, male and female. And God would gather them to the ark. And the ark would accept them. And he would, God would preserve life through that work of Noah, through the ark. So Noah and his, eight, his uh, family members and all the animals went into the ark. And God closed the door, doors of the ark. And that's when the world was judged with water. So that's why in the Old Testament... There is the chosen people of God, Israel. And all the other, there's many many unclean animals that are a shadow or an image of the Gentiles. We remember the story where Peter was praying and in his vision, he saw that there was a a blanket that was dropped down from heaven. And all these animals uh, that were on the earth were on that blanket. And God's voice said to Peter, rise up, kill and eat. Peter replied, I've never in my life eaten an unclean thing. And God responded, what God has made clean, do not call unclean. And this vision happened three times to Peter. And when Peter was thinking about why, what this could mean, we know that Cornelius sent a messenger to Peter to invite him to speak of the gospel. And that's why uh, Peter 
he preached the gospel to those of Cornelius' household, and that was the start of the preaching to the Gentiles. We know that the Gentiles, um, before the Jews, in the Jewish eyes, in the Jewish perspective, are dirty, kind of like animals, unclean animals. But God, in God's eyes, God is saying that what God has made clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, what God has made clean, you shall not call unclean. And that's why in the ark, both you know Jews and Gentiles, God has gathered everyone. You know, Noah didn't go around and capture all these animals by himself. That is also the image of the church. If we look at the history of Israel, there are many uh, shadows of the work of salvation that w- was going to be done. And he also, sh- and the Bible also shows the um, images of the church, shadows of the church. The fact that we are saved also means that our Christian life has now begun. It's not that, oh, you know, we actually finished our life by being saved. No, but actually when you're born, that's the beginning of life, right? So physically, um, personally, uh, uh, spiritually, we need to grow. Uh, you know, being saved is the beginning. Our Christian life has begun. And our Christian life is in a word, put simply, is church life. If you don't know what a ch- the church is, then you cannot live a Christian life. That's why the very first thing that we need to understand when we are saved is to understand what the church is. If we do not understand what the church is, then we cannot live a correct Christian life. We can fail in our Christian lives. I was born again in 1962, uh, September, uh, October 30th, at around 6 p.m. You know, before I was saved, for 10 years, I was, I lived a so-called Christian life. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. After I was saved, I lived a Christian life for 10 years, and I was saved, and I wanted to preach the gospel. But I didn't know what the church was, and so I didn't know how to to live my Christian life. And you know, if for me to preach the gospel, I need to be empowered. So for four years, I would, you know, I attended all these different um, seminaries in order for me to receive some power. Right? I met a lot of different kind of people, and I realized that wasn't it, and that wasn't it. And God allowed me to have the discernment to understand. If I wasn't really saved at the time, then I don't know where I would have, you know, where I would have been, would have ended up in. And I'm thankful for God for protecting me. But, you know, now in the church, I realize this is the beginning of Christian life. And until, from then until now, I realized Christian life is life that's lived in the church, live with the church. The church is the gathering of the saints. If we preach the gospel without knowing what the church is, then that also will come to failure. There are some people who stay in our church for a little bit and they leave because they think that they can, they have individually themselves the power to evangelize. And I can guarantee you 100% that person, it didn't work out for that person. After we're saved, we need to understand what the church is through the word of God. That is uh, of utmost importance. The church is the gathering of saints who are gathered by the Holy Spirit. It is the gathering of of those kinds of persons. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That, that bond of peace is love, right? So we have to keep the unity of the Spirit. We who have understood the love of Christ, now through the Holy Spirit, have, we have become made one as soon as we are born again. Not through our own effort, but we need to, but by the Holy Spirit, we have to enter into this church. Uh, on the Pentecost, 
there were 120 people, and then there were 3,120. There was 5,000 people. That number increased again and again, more and more, and their hearts became one. They loved one another. They preached the gospel. And for the gospel, even many, many saints had to die. They laid down their lives for the gospel. But the place where born-in Christians gather their hearts or gather together, right? As for the saints who are on the earth, that is the church. They are excellent ones. In the eyes of God, the saints, the church is excellent, is beautiful. You know, some people, let's say he, some person, he um, sold all of his possessions in order to, to buy this one item that he thought was so precious, that person would never let that possession go. We who have been saved by the precious blood of, God, of Jesus Christ, God gave his only begotten son for us, to pay that high price. Therefore, in, in his eyes, we are extremely precious and ex- excellent and beautiful. But if we are lost before him, then we have no value, right? We need to be with God in order to be precious before him. We as Christians, you know, the saints who are on the earth, they're excellent before the eyes of God. And because we're excellent, we also must think of each other as excellent. We must honor one another and think of each other as precious. There's nothing more precious on, in this world than a brother or a sister, Right, those who have been saved by that same blood, the blood of Christ. So the saints who are on the earth, they are excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Before we were saved, we had sufferings and hardships in this world, trampled by the world, hungry in the world. And what is the joy that joys that we had in this world? You know, is it to go play with your friends or eat or drink? Was that joy? No. Those are things that will quickly vanish away. But, you know, when you go home, you have your loving wife, your son, your daughter, your parents. And that family, that family is where we rest, right? My only place of rest is my family. There is that kind of joy in the family. And to not be able to experience that joy in a family is a problem. But we as Christians have a greater joy than this. We have one God, the Father. We are one brethren, the brothers and sisters. We have been saved by the same blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are people that are going to live together eternally in heaven. There's nothing more precious to us than each other. If a Christian does not regard his brothers and sisters as precious, then that's not okay. Whether, regardless of whether a son or daughter is, is smart or not, or whatever, uh, is a troublemaker, doesn't matter. The parent still loves the child, is precious before his parents' eyes. That's why we forgive each other's wrongdoings. We, we hug each other. We accept each other. We try to make each other happy. That's an obvious thing. Just as much as God regards us as precious and excellent, We also must love one another. We also must honor one another. And in that, in that fellowship, that is where the delight of God is. You know, for the sake of the church, Apostle Paul prayed. And also for the the work of the ministry. And he said that even if I were to give myself as an offering, that would be my joy if it's for the edification of the church. That's how precious the church really is. If you don't understand the preciousness of the church, then even with little problems, you'll fight with one another. You'll you'll, you'll try to devour one another, criticize one another. Let's stop that. If in the eyes of God we are precious and we neglect one another, then is that right before God? Pray about it and figure out if that's right or not. Therefore, we as born-again Christians, uh, as the saints of God, are precious in, in His eyes. The Bible also talks about 
many uh, uses many expressions to describe what the church is like. The relationship between Christ and the Christian, or the gathering of Christians. That's why in John chapter 10, verse 16, it says that Jesus is the shepherd, and we are the flock that is being brought up by the shepherd. That's why in John 10, 16, whether it's Gentile or Jew, they are one flock. Right? There, there will be one flock and one shepherd, it says. Our good shepherd is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we are the flock. We are one flock that are, is following our shepherd, our master. And we have become one flock, one gathering to follow one shepherd. And we are following our Lord. You know, my, my sheep will hear my voice and they will know who I am, right? Just as if my father knew me, and I also know the Father, so also do my sheep know me. Though we cannot see the Lord with our eyes, we believe that He is here with us. We can hear His voice. When we, hear, when we follow the Word of God, we are following Christ. We are no longer following men. You know, wherever He is, I will follow. And not only, now no longer by myself, but together with all the saints, when we listen and obey the word of God, we are one flock following one shepherd. Isn't this a beautiful expression and an image? In John chapter 15, it's, um, Jesus says that I'm the vine and you are the branches. The, the second expression is that Jesus says that he is the branch, or he is the vine and we are the branches. Jesus is the grapevine and from the roots uh, the, the roots in the soil, the nutrients are dragged up and they are spread into the branches and the branches bear fruit, right? He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So the branch, as long as it is connected to the vine and receives the nutrients from the roots, it will by itself grow and by itself bear fruit. You know, Christian life is not that difficult. All you got to do is follow the shepherd. If you leave the shepherd, then you are in great danger. And you'll be eaten by a wolf. And if a branch falls off the vine, then it will wither away. Furthermore, the Lord, Jesus Christ, is the head and the church is the body. You cannot separate a head and a body from each other. A head without a body is dead, and a body without a head is also dead, right? A head without a body can't do anything, and a body without a head is dead, right? The Lord desires to be our head and work through us. It is an absolute relationship that we need each other, right? and that is a beautiful expression of the church. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit, and we're all baptized into one body by one spirit. Because we're baptized by one spirit, we have become one body through one Holy Spirit who continues to give us nutrients in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, it says, You are the body of Christ and members individually. Right? We as a church is the body of Christ and individually we are members of that body. This is a beautiful expression and it's an absolute relationship between Christ and the church. This is not some kind of theory or some kind of heady knowledge, but it is practical truth. From the head... There is growth hormones that are spread throughout the body. From the brain, there are signals that are sent throughout the, the nervous system so that the body can react, can act according to the head's will. And Christ, who is our head, we need to hold fast onto Christ. And we need to fulfill His will. We have to follow the Holy Spirit's will, our Lord's will, and he gives us the strength to live that way as well. 
That's why the relationship between Christ and the church is the head and the body. It's actually a quite amazing expression if you think about it. Another way that the church is expressed um, is as the bride of Christ. That's why in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, it says that for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The church is a mystery. A mystery is not revealed to just anyone. In fact, if you're not saved, they will not understand what the church is. But only those who are saved can understand the church. So great is this mystery, right? A man will leave his his parents, his father and his mother. He will, you know, a man will live with his parents until he's married. Then he will leave them. Not only will the, does the, the wife leave her family, but the husband will also leave his family. And they too will become one flesh. Likewise, Christ left his heavenly glory and his Father above to come into this world in order to buy for himself his bride. When uh, Adam was given Eve, Adam fell into a deep sleep and God took out his rib and God made Eve out of his rib and you know God gave Eve to Adam. Likewise, when Christ was on the cross, you know, the, the spear pierced his side and the blood flowed out. And through that blood, Christ bought the church, right? Adam's rib was taken out of his side, but the, but the spear was plunged into the side of Christ. And therefore, the church became his bride that he had bought. And that's why Apostle Paul says, I desire to um, give you as a, a beautiful bride to Christ, right? So this relationship between a husband and a wife is a really beautiful relationship. It's not just some kind of expressive imagery, but it is practical, a practical uh, faith living. Furthermore, the Bible says that the church is the family of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are the family of God, in other words. This is a beautiful truth. You know, what is the church? If you don't understand what the church is, then... You cannot live a Christian life. We need to understand what the church is. You know, we'll be not only living with each other eternally in eternal heaven, but we also have to live with each other here in this world. You know, the family that you have in this world, you might have for a few decades. And if family members are far apart, then, you know, their hearts don't gather very well. But we as Christians are even closer than the the blood of family, right? They say that blood is thicker than water. Yes, that's true. But the Holy Spirit is thicker than blood. We are people who will live with each other eternally. Therefore, we need to live in harmony in this world together now. Therefore, we are the family of God, the household of God. The church is the family of God. And furthermore, we are uh, abiding in this fellowship with God, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, when we were saved, God called us. Why did he call us? So that we might have fellowship with his Son, with our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only would I have one-on-one one-on-one relationship with the Lord, but with all the saints, with the church, we would have fellowship with Jesus Christ. You know, in First John, it says that our fellowship, truly, our fellowship is with the, is with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We often use the word fellowship, right? We we say brothers and sisters we say fellowship 
But to a born-in Christian, there is no more beautiful word than brother and sister. You know, some people say, oh, you know, I've been, I've been, you know, a Christian. I've been in the church for a long time. Why, why haven't you given me the, the title of deacon? Why don't you give me the title of elder? Is that really important? Whether it's deacon, elder, pastor, minister, evangelist. But the name that is above all those names is brother and sister. Because Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us his brethren, right? Jesus said, do not be called rabbi because one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. This word brother and sister is really a beautiful, beautiful word. And that is fellowship. We are having fellowship. Our relationship, our fellowship is with God the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Our God, our Savior, and our Lord Jesus Christ. That holy fellowship, there's nothing, there's no other relationship that is as holy as this one. And to live within that fellowship is to live in the church, and that is Christian life. To depart from fellowship means that you cannot live your Christian life. Furthermore, the Bible says that we are the holy temple in which God abides. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, This church, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the rock of ages. And when we believe unto Jesus Christ, when we have faith in him, we are built on top of the rock. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, right? The power of Satan, the kingdom of Satan can never overcome the church. The house built on the rock, even if the waves and the the winds blow on it, we will not fall down because its foundation is on the rock. This church that has been established on Christ, Christ has established this church As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 and 22, it says, We are built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Jesus is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of this building. And it's talking about this whole building that is fitted together, right? There's some buildings that are placed right next to each other, right? They're all connected. Whether that's uh, the, you know, the church building in Seoul or the church building in Gwangju or in, in Busan or in Washington or in L.A. Or even the churches in, in Africa. That we transcend time and space and we are built together in this whole building. Which is going to be the dwelling place of God, right? The temple of the Lord. We are being fitted together, right? We are continuously being fitted together to grow into the holy temple of the Lord. To become a dwelling place of God. And when that building, when that house of God is finished... Maybe there will be, I guess you call it an opening ceremony, but there will be a great ceremony, a great feast before the Lord. That day is coming. This is the church. That's why the church and the Christian I express them in seven different images. There are probably more, but I want to share these seven with you. And furthermore, all the churches, the church, is one church with one body and one head, right? There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. We are one church. Let's take a look at Psalms chapter 133. Psalms chapter 133. 
from verse 1 to verse 3. Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This how short this psalm is, right? Psalm, you know, Psalm 119 is extremely long, but comparatively, this psalm is so short. Verse 3 verses. But the content of this psalm is extremely deep. If you look at the original version, and it is there in English, the first word is behold, right? That word is there. What does that mean? It's an exclamation, right? It also is a, a word to focus your attention, right? Behold, look, look there, right? It is focusing all of your heart and your thought onto this one focal point. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How can I explain this verse, I'm not sure. How can I do it any justice? As soon as we are saved, we know that we are saved. We are brethren that are united. We have been united by the Holy Spirit, the saved brethren, and we dwell together. Right? To dwell together means to live together. Right? We dwell together. We share our joys and sorrows. We share destinies. We share purpose of life. We live together. We die together. That's what it means to dwell together. The brethren, by the Holy Spirit, we have, who have attained eternal life, our brothers and sisters have been united and we are dwelling together. And how good and how pleasant is that? In the eyes of God, is there anything more good, anything more pleasant? No. No matter any, how much good there is in this world, no matter how much beautiful things are there in the world, they all pale in comparison to brethren dwelling together in unity. You know, I want you to just meditate and meditate and meditate upon this verse. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What's good is pleasant and what's pleasant is good. The things that we think is, are good, the things that we think are pleasant, are different from what the world thinks is good and pleasant. But we have the same, we have the viewpoint and perspective of God. Right? Verse 2, it is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. As you know, Aaron was the high priest <clears throat> and when they, uh, when they anointed the high priest, they would put oil on his head and that oil would drip down his face and the beard that was all scraggly might be joined together and drip, 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 drip down his garments. And on the, the high priest's breastplate was the 12 stones of Israel. And they would, the oil would flow down those stones. Jesus is our high priest. He is our eternal high priest. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus was anointed by God. 
And in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. When the Holy Spirit comes, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will do works that I have done, and you'll do greater works than I do, says Jesus. And the reason is because Jesus himself abides with us, dwells with us. He is our head, and we fulfill his will as his body. The power of Christ, the word of Christ. Just as God was working in Jesus, so likewise the anointing of Christ is on us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, He who establishes us is with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. We also have been anointed by God. Our head is Christ. And that oil that is pouring down Aaron's beard, right? Aaron's head, his beard, his garment, Jesus who is our head, that anointing, that oil on his head, the Holy Spirit's anointing came down to the body of, of Christ, which is the church, right? It's flowing through us. It doesn't go up, but it goes down. It flows down, running down. What that means is that it is a point, it's anointed on everyone equally, right? It doesn't go up, but it goes down. Whether you're well-educated or not, whether you're poor or rich, whether you have um, social status or not, regardless, the Holy Spirit's anointing runs down upon us. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. How uh, beautiful and holy is this kind of expression, right? Verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Hermon is the the, the high, uh, highest mountain top in um, Israel. And it is um, an ever frost mountain. So it, has all, it always has uh, snow on top of it. And the snow that melts flows into the uh, river of Galilee. Right? And so that, that dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. You know, the, the imagery of dew in the Bible is always talking about the grace of God. That grace of God. Just as if as if dew falls down Mount Hermon and goes down all the mountains of Zion and wet, gives it life and, and um, water so that plants can grow. Likewise, the oil from the head flows down to the body and all the church is uh, becomes abundant in strength and life to do the will of God. This is an, a beautiful and uh, expression that talks about the abundant life and grace that God continuously provides for the church. And it says here, for there, there, at that place, which is the church, right? For there, you know, where where brethren dwell together in unity, at that place, that is where the Lord commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. The, the blessing of eternal life. This is a true blessing. The time that you live in this world, we experience the blessings of God. And then afterwards, we have eternal life in heaven that will be enjoyed, that blessing will be enjoyed forever. How how beautiful and how how abundant and, and full is this expression about the church. And that's why the church is the body of Christ. The oil that goes down from the head continuously flows down to the body, to us as the church. We are full with the grace and with the Holy Spirit. And we know in the book of Acts, it talks about from the Jerusalem church to, to minor Asia, to Asia Minor, to Macedonia, and then to Rome. If you read the book of Acts, all those churches in the book of Acts are actually one church. Wherever the saint, or the apostles went, they preached the gospel. Salvation occurred and a church was born. But all those churches are actually one. One body, 
They united uh, physically, spiritually. We can see that in the book of Acts. And that, that church that is in the book of Acts has not stopped being a church. It continues even today. Right, the book of Acts is not the books of the apostles, but the books of the whole, the, the acts of the Holy Spirit, the acts of the church, right? the acts that God has done. The acts. We know that the Old Testament is the acts of God. The the four gospel are the thirty three years of the acts of Jesus Christ. But from the books of Acts and on, is the acts of the church, right? The history of the church, and even the church today. Our churches nationally and our churches internationally. And there has been a, a past churches in the past, and we can't know all the churches that are born again. Right? God doesn't show us them, but God asks us to be faithful in what in our duties that we have. And on the day when He returns, as it says in Thess- Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one and two, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6 and 17, The dead in Christ will rise first, then those, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the, the dead saints there of the past will be revived, resurrected, and we will also meet them in the air. And the whole church, every saint, will be gathered together to our Lord Jesus Christ. That day is not far away. That's why the church, we need to be united. We need to help one another. You know, even during these times, I feel like I'm learning a lot and experiencing a lot. You know, through the coronavirus, we can't gather together. And yet, I feel that our hearts are beating closer. We're sharing love. And we have the same hope and same purpose of life. And that heart to preach the gospel has not changed. And everyone is praying for the church. Um, Offerings are continuously coming in. And all the places that are suffering through the coronavirus, you know, we're helping them even beyond what we could think. And, you know, through the rains and the floods that have happened recently in Korea, some church buildings have been... um, and 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 uh, brethren have had their houses and the buildings have been, um, you know, demolished, uh, damaged. But yet, so much help was poured out to them. And I realized, you know, this is not, you know, we're not doing this because someone is forcing us to, but we're doing it because we have a willing heart, a heart of love, and that's showing me that we are one, we are united. In Israel, a rabbi was asked a question by a layman. He said to the rabbi, Rabbi, here's this child that has born. He has two heads. Is this one person or is this two, two people? And the rabbi thought about it. He said, they have, they have one body but two heads. Okay, then what we will do is we'll pinch his foot. If you pinch his foot and only, if, if both of the heads scream out in pain, then they're one person. But if only one, one of the heads scream out, then they're two people, right? It's a funny story, but it's, it's a true thing that we can understand a lesson from. Now we, we share our joys. We share our tears. We share our happiness. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, we are one body. We share in joys, we share in in tears, we share in in gladness. When there is work of salvation that is done, we rejoice together. When there is sufferings, we pray together, we unite. Why? It's because we are one. But when there is no joy, when there is works of salvation being done when there is no prayers being offered for those who are suffering and no desire to participate in in that suffering and, and to, to come alongside them, then what, what kind of unity is that? What kind of body is that? Furthermore, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, 
It says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We, have been, we who have been united with one spirit, we learn the words together. And that's why it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. The Holy Spirit who abides in us teaches us everything. He who gives us all things, he also teaches us how we should walk, how we should live as Christians after we're saved. He gives, he teaches us everything, right, concerning all things, right? It's a true teaching, not a lie. So if we, if we obey his teaching, then we will abide in him. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, And now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. What does it mean to be connected to the church? That means to abide in the teaching. Abide in me and I in you, Jesus said. Abide in that teaching. Ch- little children, abide in him. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. You know, when the Lord returns, those who are living a correct Christian life in the church, then they will not be ashamed. So we need to come to a unity of what we believe and what we know. But if we if we believe in different things, then our hearts will be separated and we cannot be united. There are times when the this, when the the devil will try to input false doctrines in the church. So we need to have a unity of the of faith and knowledge. If we know different things, then we believe different things, and we have divided hearts. The church, the Lord establishes um, workers for his work in the church. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. <clears throat> the Lord gives gifts of works to certain people for the equipping, for the work of ministry. Apostles and uh, apostles and prophets existed in the Old and New Testament, but no longer do they exist now. But what do we have now? We have evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So evangelists, pastors, and teachers are those who you know teach the gospel, who um, supply nutrients from the Word of God to those to the body of Christ, to those who are saved, right? Uh, the pastor is also can be referred to as like a shepherd, um, as as our Lord is the shepherd and we are sheep. Likewise, there are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why did God, why did the Lord give these workers? It's for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. You know, whenever you want to do something, you don't take little children to do the work with you, right? You take adults who are well trained to that work. Only when you have mature Christians in the church can you give them works to do so that we can so that together we can equip the saints. And all of that is for the edifying of the body of Christ. And through the workers that Christ has established, the body of Christ is more and more established. 
So there are, there must be workers in the church that are established by the Lord. That's why in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 it says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So those who teach the word of God and, and um, lead, it says, Remember them who rule over you and follow their faiths and consider their conduct. So as you know, the pastors in our church need to realize that everyone is watching them, not just the words they say, but how they are living according to the words that they speak of. If you don't live, if your conduct is not with your talk, then you become a liar. No one's going to follow what you say. We need to consider the outcome of their conduct, and then we have to follow their faiths. Apostle Paul said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. That's why in, to the Thessalonian church, Paul says, you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. You know, you know me, you've seen me, you've seen the life that I've lived. <clears throat> That's why even until the end, Apostle Paul was working as an established worker of Christ. He was an example uh, to ministers who would come after him, workers who would come after him, even till the very end of his life when he was beheaded. Ministers must be faithful to their work until the end. And those who listen to those words must consider the outcome of their conduct and then follow their faiths. Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. So in the church, there are workers or ministers that are established by Christ who preach the word. Um, and the Bible says that those who preach the word are worthy of double honor. So we need to be uh, submissive to them. And even if, you know, the pastor of the church makes a, a small mistake in his words, that doesn't mean that we should totally ignore his whole his whole his whole ministry, uh, but we must understand that the Lord establishes ministers in his workers in his church, and in his in his church, the Lord um, supplies, protects, teaches, and guides his children. In John chapter twenty one, verse twenty five, the resurrected Christ called Simon Peter, and he said, to, he said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Three times Jesus asked this question to Peter. And three times Peter asked, uh, answered the same way. And Jesus answered the same way three times, Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. To those who really love the Lord, Jesus says to feed his lambs, gives them that work of feeding his lambs to them. Now, in the church, there are those who do the work of feeding the lambs. That's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, it says, But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. You know, the Apostle Paul, he strived night and day. He sacrificed himself for the church, just as a mother will cherish her own children and raise them in love. God loves his children and supplies his children in the church. But the workers of the church need to work with the love of God given to them. That's the only way. And furthermore, the church is under the protection of God. 
in Deuteronomy chapter 1, for verse, uh, verse 31 and onwards, it says that in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place, right? After um, Israel left Egypt and was in the wilderness for 40 years, right? God said that he carried he carried his, his people like a man carries his son. Who went in the way before you, verse 33, to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, in the fire by night and the cloud by day. God was saying, I protected you and I led you. God supplies his children and grows them in his church. He teaches them, he guides them, he protects them. If you depart from the church, you cannot be supplied with his grace. If you depart from the church, you cannot receive his protection. You cannot receive his teaching. If you leave the church, you cannot lead, you cannot have the Holy Spirit's leading. That's why we need to cleave to the church. And when God saved his people Israel from Egypt, for 40 years they passed through the wilderness, and then they finally entered into the promised land of Canaan. Likewise, this is showing us that how God has saved us from the power of Satan, and the 40 years in the wilderness is a shadow, uh, as it says in, in the book of Acts, talks about the congregation in the wilderness. It's talking about the church life, the Christian life, how God has led the congregation of Israel with a fire by night, cloud by day, the hand of Moses guided them until they entered into the land of Canaan. God led them, guided them, protected them. And until we enter the land, uh, the kingdom of heaven, the Lord will protect us and guide us. That's why Apostle Paul says that God had saved him from all wickedness and evil and he that he will lead me until the coming uh, until the kingdom so even until we enter into the land of king uh, enter into the kingdom of heaven God will protect us God will lead us if we abide in the church if we depart from the church we cannot receive God's protection you know if you look at the like you know any kind of documentary about animals when there are you know many animals when there's like a of you know like a group of animals they they pass by in the wilderness or in the in the plains or whatever and amongst around those that that group of animals might be a lion or a a cougar or a hyena right some kind of predator waiting they're waiting for what they're waiting for just one animal to depart from the group because if you're in the group even the weakest animals even the babies have protection because they put the weak ones in the middle and the adults are surrounding the outside in a in a circumference and they protect the group, right? But as soon as a, a, an animal leaves that group, it will die immediately. It will be caught. It's prey. Likewise, Satan is just waiting. He's waiting for the Christian to leave the church because that's easy food. That's easy prey. You know, just as a fish cannot live outside the water, likewise, a Christian cannot live outside the church. Just as a child cannot live outside the bosom of his mother, likewise, a, a Christian cannot leave the protection of God that's in the church. And that's for sure. Until we enter into the land of the kingdom of heaven, we must abide together, dwell together. And in that, in that gathering of saints... That's where the Holy Spirit's power is. And that's where the work of the Lord is. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? So that working of his mighty power, the greatness of his power, we need to know that power, but it works in us who believe. Right? We might... We might doubt his work. We, we might not be able to see it. 
But in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Now to him who is exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. There is a power that works in us. According to that power, we ask, we think, God is able to do above all that. Above anything we can even ask or think of. Right now, there, what, are, what, are, what do we want? What do we think about right now? Do we think about how we can live well in this world? How we can have success in this world? That's like little children playing with toys. That's useless. But for us, whether we live or die, we want to live for Christ. We want to preach the gospel. We want to do it for God's glory. That would give us great joy. And if we can live for that, if we can die for that, that would be the greatest success in our life. But the Bible says that God works in us. To depart from that gathering is to, de- is to depart from the Lord. Even if a preacher, and he, if he departs from the church, he becomes an empty tin can. He cannot do anything by himself. And yet some people don't realize that. And they think that they understood the Bible a lot. They think that they can give good sermons. They, they think that they can do it on they can make it out on their own. Do you really think that's the case? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God, the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. So we are earthen vessels, we're just clay pots. And the power of God, when, when we excel, the power of God is glorified, not us. Or the power is not in us, the power is in God. But do you think that you have power on your own? Try it. Nothing will come out of that endeavor. The church, if you don't understand what the church is, then even those who preach the gospel, if they don't understand what the church is, will fail in everything they do. Just because you have good speaking ability, because you have passion, you think you can preach the gospel? No. Only done, it is only done by the work of, of God, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing, is God's command. We are members of the body of Christ, right? That's why it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, for everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. There is many members of the body, but just as there is one body, so is Christ. There is one head, one body, and in the body there is, you know, lips, hands, foot, and even uh, body parts that are invisible to the outside eye. But because the body parts, the members become one, they can fulfill the will of the head. That's why. There is... A measure of faith given to each and every one of us. Just because uh, the lips eat delicious food, the hand can say, oh, I want to eat too. And he steals the food out of the, the mouth of the lips and tries to crunch, the hand tries to crunch the food with, with the fist. Does that work? Or if a, if a hand is waving and the foot wants to wave too, does, does that happen? Can that happen? No. Each body member is doing a precious work in its own. We need to think about what is the, the the measure of faith, what is the work that God has given me individually, and I need to be faithful to that and keep my position in order for us to become one body. So today we talked about how uh, the church is the body of Christ. And I want to talk more about this, uh, and I want to end quickly today, but... Uh, But I really earnestly desire that you would diligently stay in the church, abide in the church, know God's will in the church, and that all of us as members of the body of Christ might be preciously used for him. And the day that he comes, we can stand before him in glory. And until that day, let's not shake in faith 
And let's not have our hearts be changed, but let's be faithful to our works as members of the bodies of Christ. Let's pray together. Merciful Heavenly Father, We were enemies to you because of our evil deeds, useless before you. But now, through we, you have uh, put us in the holy body, your body, the church, and you work through us now. And you have regarded us as members of your body. And you are with us that you might fulfill your work through us. And for this, we thank you. God, we are your body. Just as you said that you are the one who abides in us. Lord, please help us to be faithful as members of the body, to be used preciously, and that through us your gospel might be preached, that many more might be saved, that that would be to you great joy and great glory. And furthermore, in the day when you do return quickly, please help us not to stand before you in shame. We who have been saved... Our brothers and sisters, please help us not to fall away from the faith. Please protect us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.